Good morning, church. Wonderful to finally be here as your pastoral team. This is a great day for us. We've been praying for this day to come. Uh, I am Sean, for those watching online or anybody who hasn't met, met me yet. Uh, I'm the lead pastor. Amy is our new pastoral associate, and together we are the pastoral team here at West Guilford. Uh, wonderful baton passing. We have our batons hidden away in safe spots during the move from Brian. Uh, now, an apology I have to give you. Uh, when we were packing, I don't know if you've ever had packers pack up your home before, but they are really good at their jobs. And so I'm like, oh, I just have to grab my nice shoes before, you know, for the service on Sunday. They're packed. And I'm like, okay, well, I just saw my shirt, so I'm going to go grab one of my shirts. All my shirts were packed. So this is literally the nicest clothes that I own at the moment. The rest of our stuff is on a truck down in Toronto. So I did my best, and, <laughs> and that's what we get. I was, I was like, Amy and I were talking, should I wear flip-flops or my runners? And you got my runners, because I thought flip-flops maybe were a little too, uh, yeah, too pushing it. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, and a special hello to those worshiping from the gardens in Halliburton. I understand there's a number who of our, what well, we call them, uh, web rishners or pod rishners who watch from the gardens in Halliburton. So God bless you. Thank you for, uh, for joining us for worship. Um, and just as we start, I want to say I have been overcome by thankfulness. Um, I sat right where Amy is sitting the, uh, yesterday. I came in and, and finished off some of my sermon and just kind of, I wanted to organize the office a little bit. And as I drove down the country highway, I've been used to driving on a city bus to work um, and I spent time praying in the sanctuary here, it really just hit me. Thankfulness. All the little things over the years that have led us to this point, from a simple phone call and a discussion three years ago. Um, the Holy Spirit has been very present. God has been uh, present and faithful during our transition. Amy and I were talking this week. Just people who've come alongside at that moment when the bank has put a hold on our funds or something from our house, you know, like in one, God has just put people in our, uh, brought us along because he's faithful. So thankful. Uh, and even this break that we're homeless for, for a week, we, Amy and I were worried, oh, we're going to have to live at the trailer, drive an hour. God knew we needed it. What, it's just been a blessing for us and our family to, in between packing up and then and unloading here, we get this week where God has just been present. So just overcome by by thankfulness. Um, as most of you know, we get the keys for our new house this week, and our stuff arrives, so I'm just going to beg some patience this week as we unload all of our things. They have a way they have to do it over three days, and so we have to be present for that. So if, uh, uh, we're going to be homeless, uh, or um, kind of busy with that this week, so I just beg some patience. And the, But the following week, we're going to be really hitting the ground running full-time as we, uh, we help with the Vacation Bible School, um, which brings us to our announcements. Uh, so as most of you know, or sorry, our announcements, uh, Monday at 10.30 a.m. is Kingdom Prayer Time, and I do, we're going to continue to do this, uh, going, it's just going to be very important in our ministry, okay? Prayer is the fuel of revival. There is no growth, there is no revival, the gospel goes forth when we pray. So if you are a prayer warrior, I'm calling you to arms, come on out to Kingdom Prayer Time, I think Amy's going to be really deep into that, that she is a prayer warrior. Um, I try, <laughs> and I, I love to pray, but there's a special power that some people have, and if you have that, I'm calling you, please come on out to Kingdom Prayer Time, and let's pray for revival, not only in West Guilford, but in Halliburton. Uh, Monarch Bible Camp is still looking for helpers for next week for food for the Vacation Bible School. So if you're able to help with that, uh, Deb... Vesselitis? Did I get that right? No, I, I, I butchered it just like Brian used to. All right. Well, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> so so I'm, I, I apologize. Um, and then we do have, I had a phone call with D. Ruth this morning. Uh, early when I first arrived, she called just to see if I was going to be here. And she wanted me to, to put this announcement forward for prayer, but also as an answer to prayer. So D. says, Timothy Dwayne Monroe McClellan joined us July 2nd at 11.25 p.m. Round of applause for that. Grandchild. Uh, weighing a whopping three pounds. 
Uh, he is in NICU, though, and doing very well, getting some help for his breathing and nutrition through an IV for now. Diana is good, and the doctor and nurses are very impressed with how little Tim is doing for 28 weeks gestation. Uh, they're going to keep everyone updated. We're going to keep them in our prayer, but what a wonderful answer to prayer. I know she said, and they appreciate, the whole family appreciates that. So if we continue to hold them up, I know Amy's going to hold them up uh, in prayer as well. I'm going to ask her to come up. Um, she's going to do our pastoral prayers after our call to worship. Our call to worship is from 1 Peter 2.5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Some of you have asked, how, do, how, do, how should we address you and Amy? And the best way is Sean and Amy. We are all being built up to a spiritual priesthood. We are all pastors. I might be the lead pastor, but I consider every one of you pastors as well. So just Sean and Amy, let's pray. Loving God, it is wonderful, it is beautiful to come together as the church and worship. Thank you for all those souls who are here worshiping Lord God and for those who are worshiping online. We pray for your presence and that you make yourself known. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's keep praying. <laughs> we'll do our um, our prayer time together and then go right into our, our worship time. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your body, the body of Christ, God, one another. It is such a blessing to be together. And God, we, we pray for Brian and Diane as they transition into retirement. Lord, we ask your abundant blessing to be on them. We pray for times of rest, of restoration, of joy and peace, and just that well-earned tranquility. Lord, we pray for Brian Monahan as he recovers from his stroke. We pray for his wife, Carol, as she supports. Lord, we just pray for continued healing for him. We pray for stamina for her. And Lord, that your peace would be resting on both of them. And we pray for little Timothy born uh, this week. God, we just ask for your strength to be pouring into him, that you would be breathing life into him at every moment. And we pray for Diane and her recovery and the family as they come around and support. Lord, we thank you for all of the ways that you've blessed us. We thank you for your presence here among us. And Lord, we love you. And we're here to worship you. And we thank you for your presence. Amen. All right. As you're able, let's uh, stand together and we will sing some praises to the Lord. Uh, if standing is a distraction for you, though, just stay seated. The whole point is to be able to focus fully on having a moment with Jesus. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love!
Wisdom and thou my true 
So moved, I almost forgot to bring my sermon into the pulpit. Let's pray together. Be thou our vision, O Lord. Bring us into your presence. Help us know your presence is within us, the Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and all our meditations be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. So one of my mentors in ministry uh, used to have a saying about clear preaching. And what he said is this. He said, before you say anything, tell them what you're going to say. Then while you're saying it, tell them what you're saying. And then when you're done, tell them what you said. Be clear. If you're not clear where you're saying and where you're going, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew. Like, no one's going to get it. So tell them what you're going to say. So in that, kind of in that and with that in mind, I'm going to do this today. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, first of all, I'm going to give a bit of a background where Amy and I come from in ministry, because we have an introduction for ministry. But we also have, second, an introduction to the book of Acts, because I'm introducing a series we're going to go through over, over the next year pretty much six months to a year it's going to take us, I think, to get through Acts. And then we're going to open the first five, uh, five verses of Acts. And in there, if you open to Acts 1, 1 to 5 in your Bibles, if you have them with you, I think one of those verses contains, is one of the most important verses to understanding the rest of the New Testament. So if you look at verses 1 to 5, see if you can, you can see which, what is, which one of these does Sean think helps, helps us understand how to approach the rest of the Bible. So the series we're going to go through is the book of Acts. Uh, we're, we're pretty much, that's what we're going to do. I preach expository. I like to preach through entire books of the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. Every now and then we may back away. If there's a pressing issue in the world, like for instance, when 9-11 happened, if you weren't preaching on God's grace and the providence of God and, and, and fear at that time and weren't stopping what you were doing as a preacher, I think you were kind of failing. Like you needed at that moment to preach about something else. So some, things might come up as a community where, okay, I'll do a three-part series on grace or a three-part series on, on grief or fear or, or something. If I really feel, if the deacons and I and Amy feel the Lord is leading us in that direction, but by and large, we're going to preach through Acts over the next while, uh, which I'm excited about. So we are here. Next slide. You are here. Sean and Amy's background, okay? Tell them what you're going to say. So I'm going to say I give a background. Uh, and this is going to actually flow and kind of set the stage for what else, what, uh, for the rest of the sermon this morning. So basically, this is a story of how Amy and I learned to seek Jesus first, because we didn't always do that in our ministry. Well, at least I didn't. Usually, I think Amy was telling me I should. All right, so seek Jesus first. No matter how gifted you are in ministry, if you're not seeking Jesus first, you're going to be lost. Uh, I met Amy at Wycliffe College uh, when I was doing my, my seminary training. She was, uh, oh, next slide, back, back one, back one, there, that's Wycliffe College, picture off of Wikimedia, it doesn't really look that grand, it's a little more run down than that, but <laughs> Wikipedia made it look great. Uh, Amy was the cute Christian girl on the third floor who sung like an angel, and I was one of the smelly seminarians who lived in the basement, literally in the basement, there were like three rooms, 
And for some reason, they thought, we'll put Sean in the basement. So I lived in the basement. Amy lived on the third floor. Uh, for three years, we, we, we were friends and we dated. Uh, and we were married the same year that I graduated uh, from, from Wycliffe. And we moved to Bracebridge. And we moved to Bracebridge. It was a larger church there. I was the associate pastor. It was supposed to be 50% youth ministry. It was 100% youth ministry when we got there. That's kind of how things work. Um, but we know we were there, excited. I was armed with a fresh master's degree and no experience. There is nothing more dangerous than someone armed with a master's degree and no experience. And, and it showed in how I went about doing ministry and how we went about. Um, the church itself in Bracebridge, I have to say at the time, was not exactly gospel-centered. Is that fair to say? It was not exactly gospel-centered. Um, so I went about doing ministry with Amy and I in a way that was exactly as I had been taught. Um, I imposed my priorities on the ministries I was in charge of, and I was going to show these people how to do ministry. Could you imagine <laughs> how well that probably went? It did not go very well, and nor should it have. Um, you know, God is good, and God's going to use whatever you give to him. And there was some fruit from that ministry. There were some enduring relationships. But at the end of the day, uh, we felt like we were stuck in the mud in our ministry. And it just, the Holy Spirit power, I really felt like I was quenching the Spirit with how we were approaching ministry. And, uh, and we learned the Lord really humbled us in that ministry. So then when we moved, uh, it wasn't until we took a pastoral charge in Emsdale. Does anybody know where Emsdale is? Someone was talking about Berks Falls with me. Emsdale is just north of, uh, of Huntsville. It used to be on the highway. Now it's not even on the highway. Um, see if this sounds familiar. Emsdale has a pizza place a store, and a community center. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> it's actually smaller than, than West Guilford, to be honest with you. Um, but we really learned, we had learned our lesson at, at Bracebridge, and we slowed down. And we went in there just deciding, this time, we're going to pray first. This time, we're going to get to know and love the people first, God's people who are there and discover what's going on, what the gifts are, and really seek Jesus. And go in seeking the Holy Spirit and his will with the community of faith who were there. And I'm going to tell you, that little church, compared to the larger church in Bracebridge, was a dynamic ministry. The Lord moved there. Um, and it was all God. And the, as the people of that church moved forward in faithfulness, um, and it was all Jesus through simply seeking him. And I really just remember thinking, okay, I get it now, Lord. It's not all about what Sean knows and, you know, the latest techniques. It's about seeking Jesus and his will for the church. A great example of what I'm talking about is Amy and I were walking around the town one day, not a long walk, but we were walking around the town one day and we were just saying to ourselves, you know, we know, Lord, we we're not saying to ourselves, we were praying. We were saying, Lord, what are we doing here? Like, why have you brought us to Emsdale at this time in our ministry? And immediately, well, as we were praying and asking God why he'd sent us there, we noticed kids everywhere. We noticed a bike in every driveway. Even the older folks, they had, a, they had their grandkids' bikes in their driveway. And we really, the Lord showed us that, the, all these kids with nothing to do, and we had this vision that one day, those kids will be running up to us, saying, hi, Sean and Amy, walking along with us and us just talking about their lives and what's going on. And so we, did, we brought that to the church, and the church had a real heart for youth ministry. We knew that anyways. They had a heart for young people, but really didn't know how to reach out. And we decided as a church to start an after-school program at the same time bingo was happening at the community center. That's how it works, right? You've got to know what's going on for something to work. But I tell you, within a month, was, what did you say a month, maybe two? Somewhere in there, maybe two months, 70 kids were coming to our after-school program because we stopped we prayed, we listened, and the Holy Spirit and Jesus did his work. Very humbling experience. And I tell you what, by the time we were done our ministry, before I moved to the military, kids were running up to us. Hi, Sean and Amy, and walking along. And we were discussing their lives and what was going on that day. After we left, Amy was still getting calls from the girls as they became teenagers and were dealing with the stuff that teenagers deal with and just needed to talk to somebody. The Lord is good when you stop and you listen. He'll tell you where to go and what to do. 
Um, fast forward a little bit, uh, I joined the military, deployed overseas, came back, um, and I was posted to the chapel as a, as a chaplain. Before my promotion to major as a senior captain, I was posted to the chapel in Petawawa. Now, I gotta tell you, the chapels are not the best attended churches in Canada. They're actually, there's not a lot of people that go to base chapels. Okay, so the base chapel is kind of like a cross between, most base chapels are a cross between the United Church and the Presbyterian Church, but not the good stuff from the United Church and the Presbyterian. If it's the most boring things, that's what the chapels look like. I have some wonderful dynamic friends who are in ministry, so it's not to get down on them, but uh, it's just, you know, and people, it just weren't, they weren't, aren't connecting at the time, weren't connecting with people, nor was the ministry there. It's not the most desirable posting to go to a chapel. Okay, most chaplains want to be in the units with the soldiers in the field or deploying overseas. But it's, it's a two to three year posting. And we didn't, so that means we didn't have a lot of time in the chapel to shape the ministry. But we still had learned our lesson. Even though the world said two to three years isn't a lot of time, we're like, no. We stop, we listen, we pray with the community because we'd learned our lesson. We took six months of listening time, which is probably the least amount of time you want to take, but six months to a year you usually do. We took six months, we prayed and listened with the chapel committee. We prayed and we listened. There was a whole team of chaplains I was overseeing there at, at, the, at the chapel. And over time, the Holy Spirit led us to invest in music, to invest in our Sunday school, but really to refocus the ministry to soldiers and the families. We actually branded the chapel the Warrior Chapel. Chapel named after Warrior St. George for Warriors. Now that sounds weird to us as civilians in West Guilford, but for the military, when you call something the Warrior Chapel, especially in the Army, it clicks. And the soldiers got it right away. And that was the Lord, because I was just in conversation with someone that came up, and that became our slogan. And we connected, and the ministry, it took off. It took off, because we'd stopped and we prayed. Within a year, it was pretty much the largest chapel, at least the largest Protestant chapel in the country, because the Lord moved and showed us the way to go, because we stopped. Again, not to us knowing what to do, following those latest trends that you learned from Willow Creek at the time, but listening understanding, praying, and following the leadership of the, of the Spirit. So friends, what's the plan going forward? That's our plan. Pray, listen, meet, and then pray some more for the next year, six months to, six months at least, but in six months to a year. And we're going to wait on God to show us His will. And part of that is our sermon series. Acts, the early church witness. That early church witness doesn't show up, so I'm going to have to change the font. But uh, I'm a designer, so that, something like that drives me nuts. But All right, so Acts, the early church win. As we discern our way forward together, we're going to explore the origins of the church and we're going to, on how the church was built on the foundation of Jesus because we want to build our ministry and continue to build our ministry on the foundation of Jesus. I say continue because I know that you guys working with Brian were building on Jesus. And we're going to continue to do that. So let's uh, open up. I'm going to open the passage here now. And we're going to look at Acts 1, verses 1 to 5. And then I'm going to introduce, we're there. We're going to introduce the book of Acts itself. Reading from Acts, chapter 1, starting at the first verse. I'm reading from the ESV. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who is a famous Baptist preacher uh, from England, said of Acts, he said this, Live in that book. Live in Acts, I exhort you. It is a tonic, the greatest tonic I know in the realm of the Spirit. So for the church, Acts is a tonic of the Spirit. So we're, gonna, we're going to live in the book just like Martin Lloyd-Jones says. Uh, the book of Acts 
is actually part of a two-part series. Okay, Luke Acts was actually one two parts of the same story, and Luke wrote them. Uh, Luke Acts. We all like to think of Paul. How much Paul wrote of the New Testament? Luke actually wrote thirty percent of the New Testament. Luke Acts is thirty percent of the New Testament. Okay, so it's very important in the history of the church for us to understand what it is the Spirit is saying to us through Luke Acts. After John's gospel, the final gospel, we believe, was completed, the four gospels were kind of put together. We always say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Acts was kind of relegated off to the side. In the mind of the church, Luke and Acts were celebrated or were separated. And then Acts is kind of acts as a bridge to the, to the letters of the apostles afterwards, which is great. I mean, that's fine. It's a good function for it. It kind of gives us a sense of salvation history. But however, from the start... Uh, the two books belong together. And so you're going to often find during this series, we're going back into Luke because it's, we're basically just going back into the same book. Luke was written for, for Theophilus as well. Uh, and we're going to look back to the gospel and quote the gospel of Luke quite often. Uh, we're going to see that Acts is a historical book. 90% of what we know about the early church is either found in Acts or confirmed by Acts. 90% pretty important book in the history of the church. Pretty important book to understanding the nature of the church and how the Holy Spirit built it. And it is a history, but it is a purposeful history. It is a lesson through story. That's what Acts is. And I want to make a very important point here about history. There is no such thing as what we call a dispassionate observer. Okay, in the age of science, We've kind of been being convinced that, that history is like science, in that um, we're dealing with raw facts, we're dealing with raw, raw figures, and our historian here, we take us to our next slide, our historian is like, he's a neutral observer, and he's just giving you the facts, just the facts, folks, right? And, and he's a neutral observer, and he's not really, has no agenda behind what he's doing. The fact is, the neutral observer, the dispassionate observer, does not exist. Um, the, the fact is, every history that's ever written has some sort of an agenda behind it. Every history. I was, uh, a good example, I was reading a rather large history of Chairman Mao. I don't know why, I read this kind of thing for some reason. Um, just his rise to power in China. And uh, it was, the book itself was, was, was billed as a history written by a professor, and it's just a general history of Mao. And, and his rise to power. But it became very apparent as I read through the book that it wasn't just a history. That the whole purpose of this book and the way this, this fellow was, was telling Mao's story was to try to show that Chairman Mao was not a real communist. He was just someone who, who used communism as an opportunist. Um, so that was kind of the whole theme of the book. Because the fact is, Mao, Lenin, and Stalin are a little bit of a black eye when it comes to Marxist ideology, right? If you're trying to sell communism, apparently the, 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 the past heads of, the, of communism killing millions of people is not a good selling point. So what you read in a lot of histories about uh, the communist leaders of the past, what you read a lot is it's not uncommon for academic histories to push a narrative that these guys, none of these guys were real communists, okay? There's an agenda behind it. Whether or not that's true or not, I'm going to leave to the side. But there is an agenda behind even careful academic history in today's university pushes some sort of an agenda. So when people say, well, there's an agenda behind Acts, there's an agenda behind all history that you're going to read of some kind. It's told and arranged in a particular way for a particular purpose. And it's even more true in the ancient world. They weren't, they weren't bashful about telling a story. They were very careful about the details. In ancient history, very, folks like, like, uh, uh, like Luke, for instance, uh, were very careful about the details, but they were also very careful to tell a lesson, to tell a moral through the story that they were telling. And so Acts is no different as history. It is a purpose-written document. And the purpose of Acts was this to witness to the power of the Holy Spirit through the early church. Acts is a proclamation 
of God's goodness to his people. As we go through, that's going to come up and up over and over again. Acts, the book of Acts, is a proclamation of God's goodness to his people. What a great book to study as we move forward together. It's written in a, bio, in a series of biographies. It's just a series of biographical story. Plutarch, who was a historian from, from Luke's time, said this. He said, it isn't really in the great deeds that you learn about historical figures. It's not in their great deeds, but it's in the details of their lives that you actually distinguish their real character. It's not in how Alexander the Great conquered all of Asia, but in how he was with his soldiers that you really learn about the man. I love to read, for instance, a good example is a sports biography. I love to read the stories of the heroes that I grew up watching. I just finished one on, on Burns, Pat Burns. So I got to see from the inside view of those 92, 93 Leafs. Remember back when they were good and they didn't <laughs> always lose in the first round? But anyways, back when they made it to the conference final, it was amazing to kind of read that story. You know, I can read the back of Wayne Gretzky's hockey card and see all the awards that he, he received. But then there's something, there's nothing like a firsthand witness of stories from the people who were around him to really get a sense of what it was like. Remember when we were, you know, I was down on Bosch Kong Lake watching on CBC, fuzzy CBC, you know, all those, these dramatic moments that we saw happen. It's great to hear firsthand what that was like to be on the ground. There's nothing like a firsthand witness of stories from someone who knows him. That's how Acts is written. And that is great for us because the Bible isn't a black and white set of rules. It's God's big story that we are all a part of. The Bible is God's big story that we are all a part of. N.T. Wright, the sometimes evangelical N.T. Wright, described Scripture as a five-act play that we are all a part of. And that's how we understand and read and live Scripture. The first act, of course, is creation. The second act, we don't come out too well. It's the fall. Then God calling his people back to himself in act three with Israel. Act four, Jesus comes and saves. And then act five is the church. And acts in the, the New Testament are kind of the first part of act five. But you and I live in the second part of act five. We live in biblical history. And so all of, those, all of those themes, all of those lessons, all the Holy Spirit plots from the first four acts, we, we read that script to know how to let those live and move through our lives now. Living biblically means taking the thrust of salvation history and letting it flow through our lives as, as a church. It's taking salvation history, learning what it is, and what it looks like, and letting that flow through our lives as Christians. That's what it means to live biblically. That's an awesome way, I think, that he's come up with to understand life in the Spirit. And Acts is a key moment. It's the beginning of the church. We're seeing just a little bit of Act 4, and then transitions quickly to the church in the Holy Spirit. It's a key point of focus for our formation as individuals, and as Jesus' church, learning to live faithfully in a hostile world. Understanding our place in biblical history, friends, is key to Christian living. Central to Christian living. In an early church witness which highlights the character of the apostles and their lives, that is a gift of God to his people. Because you really learn the character and the struggle of the Christian life and the struggle of the church through biography not through reading the back of a hockey card. And so that is how we're going to approach the prologue here of Acts 1, 1 to 5. So there you are. We're on the final part of the sermon, bringing it home. The final apprenticeship of the disciples we're seeing here. And so we see verses 1 and 2. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. It is written that we can have certainty about the things we've been taught. Acts roots the Christian witness in history. 
Christianity is a parallel history going on behind the scenes of the world. So you have world history, and Christianity is kind of a parallel history that's going on there. Theophilus, um, I've read, there's a number of theories as to who, um, actually, if you can back up one, please. Uh, Theophilus was, uh, there's a number of theories of who he was. The one I find most compelling is that he was a middle-class, uh, well-educated person from Rome. And so what Luke is trying to do in Acts is he's taking all these, these time frames that Theophilus would have been familiar with, and he's lining up Christian history beside it to show him what real history is and to root the Christian message in history and in time and space for Theophilus and for the people around him. It wasn't just written for it. It was being written to be handed out and shown to people. He's lining them up side by side to understand what is real. No matter what's going on in the world, he wants Theophilus to understand what is really real and what real history is. For us, friends, there's a message in there. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. I've taken part in a war. These things happen. There will be powerful people making powerful proclamations. NATO is meeting in Europe right now. And you have all these real important people making all these proclamations. But no matter what they say, Jesus' story goes on unimpeded, no matter the proclamations of the world. And we are a part of his story if we stay faithful, if we live by the Spirit and seek him. History is his story, ultimately. History is Jesus' story, ultimately. It might go on hidden from the world. In fact, that's usually how it goes on. But it is unavoidable, and it is undeniable. So we focus on Jesus first and being a part of his story. Do you feel like you're missing out on something this morning? Like maybe the history of the world, there's more to it there. If you're watching online, maybe you're just feeling like I'm missing out here somewhere. That's the Spirit saying, there's more than this world has to offer. You make Jesus Lord, you get called into the big story. And you become an actor in his play, no matter what the world says. In the history of the church, friends, in good times and bad, is a witness to that truth. So as I wind down here, I want to focus on Acts 1-3, which is the passage I mentioned that I think is key to how we read the rest of the New Testament. Key to understanding the rest of the Bible. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. This verse hit me like a ton of bricks one day when I was just doing my devotions and sitting down and just trying to focus and maybe struggling a bit. Then all of a sudden the spirit was like, boom. And I'd never realized, and I kind of, that Jesus taught his disciples for 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. And I, consider that. Consider the power of that. Jesus, you're a disciple. You've lived with Jesus. Then you've seen him die and rise again. And then you get to sit with him for 40 days while he explains what it means. Imagine that. The power in that. That's, people are like, oh, where did the disciples get all this stuff for the rest of the New Testament? Right there. Jesus sat with them over 40 days. That is what we read them trying to get across. Painstakingly, they taught it to Paul, and they're painstakingly trying to get that across to God's people, the lessons that they were taught there. And research actually shows us in learning that 40 days is like a magic number for learning. Okay, if you're going to unlearn an old habit, and you're going to form a new one, like perhaps coming back to worship after COVID, right? It takes 40 days and a lot of times, to unlearn an old habit and learn a new habit or go back to them. 30 to 40 day intensive postgraduate courses abound everywhere because 40 is a bit of a, a magic number when it comes to learning. Imagine that Jesus knew that long before we did. The Bible just has all this truth. So after walking with Jesus all those years, witnessing him die for our sins and rise again, now they sit and culminate everything with him over 40 days no wonder we can trust the deep, profound truth 
of the rest of the Bible. The Holy Spirit just bringing it all out through disciples' pens. And after that, they will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the rest of the book, it's called the Acts of the Apostles. You can see I turned to it here. My Bible says it says they're Acts of the Apostles. Um, you, can, you can call it the Acts of the Apostles. It could also be aptly titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Gospels are about Jesus, and the Acts of the Apostles are about Jesus through the Holy Spirit that he sent. But we're going to go through that. I don't want to go into too many details. We're going to get to that later in this series. We're going to seek Jesus together, not over 40 days, six months to a year, longer. We're just going to continue to seek Jesus. That's key to discernment. It's going to be key to any personal or growth as a church, and it's going to be key to life by the power of the Spirit. So I have a challenges, three Ps for you this morning. Those who are here, those who are watching online, first, I invite you to pray. And I mentioned it. Prayer is the fuel of revival. If you're not praying, you're not reviving as a church. Plain and simple. So a call to prayer. Please come together to pray. Pray in groups. Pray by yourself. Pray for your church. Second, plan. Plan to be a part of our future. I think the future is bright here. I, we've been so excited to come and be a part of your community and to, to minister to Halliburton. Um, you know, it's taken all we can do to stop but we just got to stop. We got to listen because the Lord comes first. But plan, please, to be a part of the future. I think it's bright. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then participate. Participate in worship and discernment as we go forward together. Nowhere in the Bible is there ever a Christian who lives apart from the church. Nowhere in the Bible. If, if the disciples felt like they needed to worship together, I'm pretty sure we need to worship together. I know there was a time when we had to separate and we had to worship online. The Lord knows Jesus is in control, but now it's time to come together, friends, and to participate. And I am confident that Jesus will sit with us. He promises he will. He will guide us. He will teach us, and he will show us his presence by the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. What a loving Savior. He walks with us, friends. He talks with us. He makes us his own individually and as a church, and he shows us the way forward. God bless you. I'm looking forward to the future. Let's pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks for your word. What a wonderful privilege it is to take part in your great big story, Lord. Highlight those parts of salvation history that you want to, you want to make manifest in our lives this week, Lord God. And bless your people as we go forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amy's going to come up and lead us in some more worship. First, <laughs> let's stand and sing together. Be 
receive the doxology from Romans. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.